speaker in just a minute. I'm Dr. Rowling. I'm the Chief Education Officer here at Dental CE Academy. Welcome to our program this evening. And before I introduce Tasha to all of you, I'd like to remind you that we do have a little bit of housekeeping. Please take a look in the chat area. You are going to see instructions. There is a link to download the handout as well as the CE credit. CE credit, the quiz will be sent at 635. Following Tasha's presentation, which is an hour, she'll then be talking about some upcoming events that she'll be um, holding here, which are pretty exciting, actually. We're just speaking about it. So if you'd like to stay on to learn more, we welcome you to do that. That portion is promotional. So per AGD PACE, you are not required for CE credit. I am going to go ahead now and introduce Tasha to you. Tasha is the founder of Tosh Teaching Oral Systemic Health. She's a dental consultant and educator dedicated to creating health-centered clinicians, bridging the dental medical gap and reigniting careers. Tasha teaches teams to pivot from the often practiced reactionary model to a science-backed wellness model. She's proven that a wellness-centered hygiene program creates value-based dentistry, a huge benefit in any economy. Tosh is an expert educator in dental hygiene. Her skill set allows her to teach dental teams across the globe how to engage their patients, become inspired clinicians, and skyrocket their production. When practice owners adopt these wellness-based principles, they achieve a healthier, happier, and more profitable hygiene department. So it's my honor to turn this over to you. Now, Tasha, thank you. All right. Well, hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you guys. Thank you, Dr. Rowling. And we will get right into it. So benefits of a hygiene microscope. So what we're going to be talking about today are recognizing the role of biofilm in periodontal disease. We're going to um, look at identifying the difference between high risk and low risk plaque samples under a microscope and understanding the key players in the mouth-body connection and their role in causing periodontal and systemic diseases. And hopefully by the end, everyone will appreciate the benefits um, of using a hygiene microscope. So all of this really started with the wonderful Dr. Paul Kies. Um, he lived to be nearly 100 years old. He was an award-winning and internationally resound, uh, renowned dental researcher. In the late 1970s and 80s, Dr. Kais really turned his attention to periodontal disease and crusaded for a paradigm shift in the way that dentists diagnosed and treated periodontal disease, eschewing from the traditional reliance on pocket depth me measurements, bleeding in favor of microbial testing, and treating periodontal disease as an infection with antimicrobial agents. And so he stated that his serious interest in periodontal disease really started in the 60s with findings in hamsters where that had dental caries. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, not all infected, not all, animals not infected with cariogenous streptococcus and streptococcus mu mutans often developed periodontal lesions. And when Atinomyces bacteria were inoculated from infected animals into into and inoculated into non-infected animals, it induced periodontal lesions and root caries. So with the intentions of further researching ways to control atinomyces in periodontal patients, Dr. Kais unfortunately lost all of his laboratory funding. So as an alternative method for assisting, as, as, assessing bacteria, Dr. Kais used a phase contrast microscope for the examination of subgingival plaques. <clears throat> Kais later said that after losing laboratory funding, it actually wasn't too much of a drawback because of the discoveries he had using a phase contrast microscope. So he had a TV camera, a monitor, and a tape recorder attached to the microscope, and that made it possible for him to record these microorganisms from infected periodontal pockets. And then he would follow these patients through treatment to see if he could change the, the microbiome in the mouth. And so what he said back in 1982 was, is that it soon became apparent that between health and disease, there were striking differences in the prevalence of white blood cells, the types of microorganisms, their patterns of organization, and their activity and behavior. And although microorganisms under the microscope could only be identified morphologically, I decided that all disease-associated bacteria could, would be considered risk factors and therapeutic targets. So the shapes of the microorganisms that Dr. Kais was looking at 
um, we're really more in three phases. So the first phase is, is health. So what we see in health is skin cells, cocci, and plaque. So skin cells to me on a microscope, they kind of look like an egg on a frying pan. And <clears throat> they're very normal because the epithelial cells in our mouths are just like, are just like the skin on our hands. And cocci is a healthy bacteria that we see in the mouth. They're very slow moving. They're, it, it really kind of looks like a boring slide when we just see a bunch of really healthy cocci and plaque is just irregular shaped. So when we look at a, at this slide, so this is a live slide. And as you can tell, it's, there's really not a whole lot going on. There's not much movement, but it is a live slide. The clusters that you see here are plaque. So that's just plaque mass. And if you look really closely, you can see some tiny little specks floating around there. Now contrasting this to more of a moderate risk slide. So once a, once a patient starts to get some pathogenic bacteria, what ends up happening is we see a transition in that, in that plaque underneath the microscope. And so patients will have some more rods. They'll have spinning rods, which are short, short, almost cigar shaped looking. They can have clock arm rods and even red blood cells. Now, red blood cells aren't necessarily a sign of infection. They're more a, just a sign that there was some bleeding in the area. So if we see red blood cells on a microscope, we don't necessarily know that that's infection. So looking at a more moderate risk slide, this is more what we would see. So we'll start to see a lot of spinning rods here. So contrast this slide with that initial slide that you saw, and you can see that there's a bit more activity, not quite frantic, but certainly, certainly a lot more going on. And so for the most part, these little specks or those little cigar shaped rods that you see are spinning rods. And so to me, they look like little acrobats on the screen. And then we see a dramatic difference on a more high risk, very uh, dysbiotic plaque sample. And so <clears throat> a high risk slide has, we'll see a high number of white blood cells often. We may see spirochetes and gliding rods or motile rods. And sometimes we can even see amoeba and trichinomads. So spirochetes, there's all different kinds of spirochetes. There's 57 types of oral spirochetes and they're all pathogenic. And so they're a very aggressive type of bacteria. And we can also see a lot of different types of gliding rods. Some are short, some are long, some are thick, some are, some are thin. White blood cells are just a, a, a globe. Um, and we'll look at those in a moment here. And then trichinomads and amoeba are some really icky looking buggers. And so this is a very high risk slide. So what we see on here is we see a lot of spirochetes. Again, some are thick, some are thin, and we can see a lot of rods. So the rods on this microscope slide are the stick looking things. So if you look really closely, you can see some very long sticks on there, some short ones, some are moving, some are not moving too much. And within that flurry of activity, we can also see see some spinning rods there. And I want to draw your attention to the bottom of the screen. I'll move my mouse around it here. And you see a trichinomad in there. And I think that they look very much like a mouse when we see them underneath a phase contrast microscope. Now, um, items like this, these trichinomads are actually not causative of periodontal disease, but we're only going to find them in a very high risk, uh, very pathogenic biofilm. Another example of a high risk, very pathogenic biofilm is this one here. In the center of your screen, I'll circle these guys here. These are amoeba. So there's two amoeba right here. There's another one over here. And way over to the far left of the screen is another amoeba. So oftentimes when we see amoeba on a microscope slide, it is filled with um, white blood cells. It'll cannibalize our white blood cells. There could be some plaque mass in there. And as well on this slide, we see several white blood cells here. So this is a white blood cell. This is a white blood cell. This is a white blood cell. Um, hopefully you can see my mouse on the screen here. So there's a lot of white blood cells. So again, a very high risk slide. So contrast these last two slides with those first two slides. And it's very obvious that, that of what Dr. Kais was talking about is we see a very different slide when a patient has a lot of infection in their mouth. So the, really the difference between health and disease, we can see a big difference in the plaque or AKA biofilm. So in health, we're seeing non-motile cocci and rods, whereas in disease, we see a lot of spirochetes and a lot of motile rods. We go from a gram-positive environment to a gram-negative environment, to an from an aerobic to an anaerobic, and very few white blood cells to a lot of white blood cells. So what this really tells us is that not all biofilm is equal. It really depends on how mature it is, what type of pathogens are in that biofilm. So generally, early biofilm is going to consist of gram-positive cocci. So think healthy and normal. But when that biofilm matures, and it's always going to mature, it's going to start to 
increase in the number of gram negative anaerobes. So think gingivitis and periodontal disease. So the goal is that we want to be disrupting that biofilm on a very regular basis to inhibit how, how fast it's able to mature. We also know that in periodontal infections, that anaerobic bacteria can actually outnumber the aerobic by three times. So we get a very dysbiotic environment that makes the host immune system have a really hard time fighting off these periodontal infections, depending on what type of bacteria are associated with them. And when it comes to biofilm, they actually have enhanced resistance to antimicrobials and antibiotics. They have host defense and the ability to cause disease. So in recent years, researchers have really come to see plaque as biofilm. So when we think about plaque, we really should associate it with the properties of biofilm, especially when we're thinking about very mature biofilm. And the bottom third of those pockets are, is going to have the most aggressive biofilm because they're the bottom third of pockets, especially if they're a deeper pocket in a patient, isn't going to be disrupted quite as well or quite as frequently, depending on what that patient's home care is like. So what Dr. Kais was really advocating for is a, is a big shift. And so what he said was that periodontists talk about eliminating anatomical defects and monitoring results of therapy with a probe, but we eliminate the bacteria risk factors and monitor the results microscopically. How else can you know if you've controlled the infection? So Dr. Kais used a technique that he called modulated microbial periodontal therapy. So an abbreviation for that is MMPT. And it had, and it had seven steps. And so the first step was a meticulous exam. So really nothing different than the exam that we would do today, that D180, that comprehensive perio exam. So that's really what he was doing. He was assessing what the patient's medical history looked like, what their dental history looked like, what their overall periodontal evaluation looked like. The only thing he supplemented with that was a microbial assessment. So he took a plaque sample from those, from those periodontal pockets and he put them under the microscope. Um, and it's worth mentioning here too that many of Dr. Kai's patients patients were refractory, refractory periodontal disease cases that were referred, referred to him. So many of his patients were in the farther stages um, of periodontal disease. So after step one and doing that comprehensive evaluation and then the bacteria sample under the microscope, he would educate the patient alongside them looking at their plaque sample on the microscope. So he wouldn't just tell them about what he was seeing. He would show them um, on the video screen the, pac the bacteria that was causing their infection. And then from there, depending on what his findings were, he would recommend a professional cleaning that also um, included antimicrobial agents. He was a really big fan of baking soda and peroxide. He strongly recommended that with that baking soda and peroxide that the patient work that baking soda and peroxide up in their gum tissue um, using a toothbrush and really work it in there. And so home care was a big part of, of his protocols, no different than what we would do today. And then after steps three and four, he would bring the patient back for a reassessment two to four weeks later. And so if he saw a reduction in the amount of white blood cells and the, micro, and the pathogenic microorganisms were no longer present, he would put that patient on a maintenance. However, if he did see that there was inadequate um, inadequate findings and the patient did still have a lot of pathogenic bacteria, then he wanted to modify and tweak things. So that's what he called modulation of therapy. And so oftentimes he would recommend appropriate antibiotics based on the patient's medical history, disease level, and the microbial findings. And from there, he would get them on a recall. And the, the patient's recall was always dependent on the patient's needs, including their clinical findings, the, uh, the way that they were able to provide self-care for themselves at home. You know, how good was their home care? Were they able to adequately disrupt that biofilm on a regular basis? And he was always looking at them um, under the microscope. And he really kept his patients engaged because he was always showing them their slide every single time. So for for many of these refractory cases, he was able to he was able to get them healthy and he was also able to keep them motivated because he was showing them their microscope slide. So the difference here would be taking a high risk biofilm sample like this one, for instance, that has an entire family of trichinomads on there, those little mouse looking guys that I was referring to earlier. And the goal would be after after periodontal therapy would be to get a slide that more looked like this. Sure, there's still a little bit of movement on there and there's not gonna be anyone's slides that are sterile. We all have bacteria on our body. Most of them thankfully are really good bacteria, but when we do have pathogenic bacteria, it's easy for the patient and for the clinician to see a, a very big difference of on that plaque sample underneath the microscope. Dr. Kai's approach, ba approach back then was extremely controversial. Um, 
<clears throat> Jane Brody said back in 1982 that at the heart of the controversy, controversy, controversy is an issue that has often arisen in medical care in recent years. The pitting of new, simpler, less, less expensive methods of care against established remedies that are supported by decades of experience, clinical studies, and widely accepted scientific rationale. Even though this was written back in 1982, I think it could easily be said about the attitudes, attitudes towards uh, many new technologies nowadays too. And so much of this is because of tradition, tradition, tradition. I mean, so much of dentistry relies solely on probe depths, is in our hygiene rooms anyway, probe depths, bleeding on probing, bleeding on scaling, bone loss, and calculus. But unfortunately, when we think about tradition versus objective diagnostic parameters, these traditional diagnostic parameters, many of them were really designed to look for the reactions to periodontal disease. Whereas some of these objective diagnostic parameters really can allow us to be more proactive and allowing for earlier detection and earlier treatment. So let's look a little bit more at some of these traditional diagnostic parameters. So the probe, and I'm not advocating here for not probing at all. I'm just simply saying that the understanding that we had of periodontal disease when the probe was invented in 1936 versus our understanding now in 2023 is really different. I mean, the probe was invented in 1936, gingival in index was introduced in 1963 and the papillary bleeding score in 1979. We've had a lot more uh, research in in recent days to proving that bacteria and bleeding points aren't the whole story. So the so pockets that are four that are four millimeters doesn't necessarily indicate infection. It's really more an artifact and not an indicator of an active infection. We all have seen pockets that are six millimeters, but it's an arrested infection. And all infection is going to start between one and three millimeters. So consider our jobs as dental hygienists if we were to intervene at these earliest stages. And let's look at probe effic efficacy studies. So bleeding on probing, does that mean infection? Not necessarily. So bleeding on probing is actually showing us that there's capillary fragility, not necessarily an active infection. So we really want to ask ourselves, why is there capillary fragility? We often see that that smokers have a lot less bleeding on probing, while a patient that's taking aspirin or blood thinners or having hormonal changes will oftentimes have more bleeding on probing and bleeding on scaling. Bleeding on probing actually has very little correlation to long-term bone loss. And bleeding on probing can be effective in the diagnosis and monitoring of active periodontal disease, but when it's used as a standalone, it can actually be fairly inaccurate. So accuracy to predict infection is questionable. Multiple studies reference probe technique leads to false negatives or false positives. One study found that an found an 88% false negative rate among patients with periodontal disease that had no bleeding on probing. So what that means is that 88% of the patients in that particular study did not have bleeding on probing, but they did have periodontal disease. And for me personally, in clinical practice, I found that, mo that many, if not most of my patients had bleeding on scaling long before they had bleeding on probing. So unfortunately, sometimes bleeding on probing can be a very reactionary and, and, and too late in the disease process. And so let's look at bone loss. So does bone loss represent how aggressive an infection is? And sometimes it does. So jawbone loss is the result of the host's immune system and the pathogens and inflammation. So there's an entire cascade of events that has to happen to result in bone loss. So certain periodontal pathogens have the ability to destroy bone rapidly. Some pathogens can actually hijack our immune system and turn it against itself. So patients can also have stable pockets, as we know, if the pathological process has been stopped. But how do we know that the pathological process has been stopped? We really need to know what's in the biofilm. And so bone loss is also a very important diagnostic parameter for us regarding the patient's history of bone already lost and watching them into the future. But we also must be mindful that history is not necessarily the current status of infection. So thinking about the disease process as we know it today. So we're really understanding that it's actually the interaction between the host immune system and the biofilm that are needed to progress gingivitis into periodontal disease. So if we break this down into a very simplified version, it looks like this. So first, the patient will have biofilm accumulation. So all of us have biofilm accumulation. Even after we do the best job we've ever done cleaning somebody's teeth, as soon as they leave, they're going to have biofilm accumulation. But like I mentioned earlier, that early biofilm isn't necessarily the problem. 
It's when it sticks around for too long and starts to mature that it causes a problem. So if that biofilm sticks around at the gum line and subgingively, it's going to trigger acute inflammation. And acute inflammation is a good thing in our body. It's the chronic that's not so good. So when we get acute inflammation, we also get an increase in gingival curricular fluid. So think of those, prob those probing pockets as really trying to flush themselves out. So we have biofilm accumulation, we have acute inflammation, and then we have this gingival curricular fluid that's trying to do our body a favor and flush out all that garbage at the gum line. But again, that biofilm doesn't want to go anywhere. It wants to stick around because it has a really nice little home. So if the person doesn't help by, with mechanical removal of that biofilm, it's going to stick around for too long and it's going to start to mature. And unfortunately, when all that stuff is sticking, at the gum, sticking to the gum line, that's going to favor even more the growth of these anaerobic bacteria because that whole pocket area with that increased gingival curricular fluid, all that matrix material of the biofilm gets very anaerobic. And so that's when we start to increase even further that, that anaerobic bacteria. And that will result in the acute inflammation turning to chronic inflammation. And when we transition from acute to chronic inflammation, the gum tissue actually becomes leaky and permeable. And so that's how those pathogens get into our bloodstream. And so leaky and permeable gum tissue means the pathogens can get into the gum tissue and they just simply hit a ride on 60,000 miles of blood vessels. And I think that Dr. Sidler said this so well in his article, Why Oral is Systemic. When we look at the root cause of periodontal disease pathogens, the oral systemic connection becomes clearer. Periodontal disease doesn't crawl up through your nose and into your brain. Periodontal disease does not sneak across the placenta barrier and cause pregnancy complications. Heart disease is not periodontal disease located in your chest. Oral is systemic because of the pathogens. He goes on to say that what research is finding is not that periodontal, periodontal disease causes systemic disease. It's that the pathogens that cause periodontal disease may also contribute to systemic disease. So when we see spirochetes or gliding rods on somebody's slide, we know for certain that pathogens are present in that biofilm. I love this particular diagram um, because it doesn't just show the periodontal pathogens associated with uh, it, sh it also shows the periodontal pathogens associated with these systemic diseases. So oral is systemic because of these pathogens and these pathogens live in the biofilm. So let's look at a case here to kind of make this all come to life. So if this was your guys's patient tomorrow, and this is what this is what the retracted photo looked like. She didn't have any bleeding on probing. Her pockets were within three millimeters, no bone loss, minimal plaque and calculus. Overall, she looks great. Her medical history is great. She comes in every six months. For me, back when I was practicing before a micro microscope, I would tell her, you know what? Everything looks great. I'll get you shined up and we'll get you out of here. But unfortunately, this would have been the case. For her, she had this much bleeding during gingivitis therapy for her. And her microscope, she had a whole lot of spirochetes on there. So the microscope really just helps to see what our eyes often don't see um, at the earliest stages. All too often, we, we, when we rely on our traditional diagnostic parameters, we diagnose a bit too late. The microscope just gives us an edge in finding these infections in the earliest stages, and it also allows us to show, not just tell our patients what's causing their infection. And when we can intervene at the earliest stages of infection, we can, we can prevent bone loss and systemic diseases. Sometimes it's the intervention that we do can literally simply be increased home care, getting them on a water pick. There's all kinds of, of home care modalities available now that can really help these patients. So when should we take a microscope slide? A sample can really be taken at any visit now. The ease of using a microscope chair side has never been better. And this assessment also assists us in determining if bleeding on probing or bone loss are signs of an active infection, or if there are additional systemic concerns or historical concerns that we really should be monitoring. And how do we know if the plaque sample is healthy or not? As you guys saw before, those unhealthy plaque samples look super frantic. We see all kinds of volume and all kinds of activity. So generally speaking, the more flurry of activity, the more pathogenic that, back, that biofilm sample is. And what overall is in our mouth? So overall, we're mainly seeing a lot of healthy bacteria in addition to that dysbiotic, dysbiotic bacteria because the mouth houses 700 types of bacteria that colonize all the surfaces of our mouth, not just around the gum line. And so when we see a dysbiotic biofilm, that's when we're going to see that increase in 
white blood cells because those are our plant primary inflammatory response. And so when we see a lot of white blood cells in somebody's mouth, there's a reason for it. And so that's what we need to investigate at that point. When we see a lot of spirochetes, we should really know like a spirochetes are an aggressive disease causing bacteria with the propensity to travel to the brain. I'm sure many of you have seen the spirochete and Alzheimer's disease studies. They're alarming. And although oral spirochetes are unknown to, to many of us in the dental profession, they are an infectious disease that can thrive, especially in poor hygiene conditions. And as I showed you guys earlier, we see those spinning rods, gliding rods, amoeba, and trichinomads as well. So what we do with the microscope is we assess. We take a plaque sample and that allows us to evaluate the patient on a regular visit or before, during, and after periodontal therapy. This objective data allows us to show our patients ob um, objectively what their health status is. Then we educate our patients. The ability to show versus tell what bacteria is, is in their mouth gets their attention. From there, we can explain to them what bacteria live inside the gum tissue, not just on top of it, and why that can't simply be brushed away. So professional treatment. There's not one right professional way to do scaling and root planing. There's many effective ways. However, there are a lot of there are several rather critical factors that we should really be implementing. So we want to we want to um, understand what is in the biofilm, use salivary diagnostics to determine what pathogens are present and share with the patient how important it is for them to disrupt their biofilm every single day. And then we want to use antimicrobial agents and really full mouth, full mouth um, debridement of the, of the biofilm, subgingively, supergingively, helping the patient, you know, helping them to understand like you need to brush your palate, you need to brush all the way down to the vestibule, not just the teeth and the margins. And repeat and adjust, Doc, um, Dr. Kai's called this modulation of therapy. So repeat and adjust as needed. What this really means is that um, individuals, as we know, react different to dysbiotic biofilms. Therefore, treatment needs, recare intervals, and home care regimens should be customized to each individual patient. So talking to a patient about taking a microscope slide um, can sound just like this. The next step is to take a plaque sample to put underneath the microscope. And so the reason that we do that is just because all of us could have pathogenic bacteria in our mouth. That doesn't necessarily mean that we have a huge problem. Okay. But we always like to be more proactive than reactive. Always better to be on that side, healthier, more stable, cost less money, that kind of thing. So if we do see anything that could cause you a problem, we'll let you know. Okay, thank you. So as simple as that, just one more quick step. However, the way that I often use the microscope was more like this. After I saw a change after my oral evaluation, this is how that conversation would go. Melissa, I'm seeing some changes in your gums today. There's a bit of inflammation in there and just a lot of change since the last time you were here. So let's take a plaque sample and put it under the microscope and see what's going on. Okay, you know I flossed really good last night, so I probably messed them up last night and then this morning and I had some bleeding. Mm. Well, you know, that's great to know because once you look at the microscope, it's a really great objective view on what's causing this inflammation. So if it is just because you got a little bit too aggressive in preparation for today, we won't see any bacteria on there. But if in case there, there are some bacteria that could be causing this inflammation. So the microscope is great because it's just objective and it'll let us see what's there and what's not. Okay. In this particular example, you could really insert you know, patient eats popcorn last night or, you know, nuts and some of the different things and some of the different reasons that patients feel like we're seeing a change in their mouth. And so oftentimes when patients share with us that, oh, it's because I floss really aggressively in preparation, it's because they're looking for a reason that we're seeing the changes. They're not understanding that the changes that we're talking about are actually that we're identifying an infection in their mouth. So this is the ease of taking a plaque sample, and this is start to finish here. All right, how you take a plaque sample. My favorite spot is generally the mandibular linguals. I'm gonna have you open just a little more for me, Grace. And I like to just drag my explorer, curette, anything right interproximal and get a small amount of plaque like that is all you need. And to do that one more time, you just glide along the gum line trying to go a little bit interproximal, a little bit subgingival, and a small amount of plaque is all you need. From there, touch that right to where you got your fluid ready. Gently scrape. 
gently scrape. So I have two little pieces of plaque in there. I take my cover slip, gently place it down, give a little bit of firm pressure. I like to use a paper towel to put it on and squeegee the rest of the water using fairly firm pressure. And going back on the sheet here, it's a little bit hard to see the cloud. That's what you wanna see. All right, and then the next step from there is to show our patient their plaque sample. And so uh, the lovely Grace here in this video was brave enough to go on video when she was very first seeing her slide. So I want to call your guys' attention to the look on her face as she sees it. Um, this is an older style microscope in the video. So on the video screen, it's a little bit harder to see on the recording the bacteria that was in there, but her reaction pretty much says what most patients, uh, their reaction is. <laughs> All right, Grace, so today, because I saw that inflammation in your mouth and things had definitely changed from last time and you know nothing changed for you that you're aware of. So what we're gonna look for on the microscope um, is to see if there's any pathogenic bacteria causing the inflammation that I was seeing today. All right, let's get this into focus. So what we're looking for here is different shapes of bacteria because we know that different shapes of bacteria um, can be pathogenic in nature. All right. Well, this definitely explains why I was seeing such a change in your mouth. Crazy, right? This is my mouth. It, it is. So that's generally what most patients will say is that's in my mouth because they're not expecting to see anything squiggly squirming on the microscope. I mean, most of us, we wouldn't want a bug on our floor, let alone thousands in our mouth. And so... The point that we get to with our patients is that they're, they're, they're seeing the changes that we are concerned about. And when they say that's in my mouth, their next question generally is, is what are we going to do about this? So instead of the conversation of one to three millimeter pockets is normal, healthy gums don't bleed and so on and so forth. It's I'm seeing a change in your gum tissue today. I think you came in contact with some bad bugs and your mouth got sick. So it really changes the conversation from, from, a pocket depth and bleeding points and some dental terminology that the patient doesn't necessarily um, understand to how did I get this infection? So the conversation pivots to this conversation here. So how in the world did I get this infection? Crazy, right? Yeah, I know. So with this type of infection, it's we don't always know exactly where it came from. So we do know that it's transmissible, like there's bacteria component, there is a bacterial component to it. But so we know we can get it from parents or partners or pets licking our face and things like that. Mm -hmm. But probably, you know, all of us are going to have some bacteria on our body, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're sick. But let's add addition to that different health, health conditions. So some patients that have psoriasis or some patients mm -hmm. that, you know, may have a traumatic event, go through cancer therapy or be diabetic, diabetic or, pre, or even pre-diabetes really affects the way that your body can heal. So add some stress to that, not getting enough sleep at night. All those are enough of an event in our life for sometimes that bad bacteria just to take over. So we don't always know exactly how we got this infection, but what we do understand better than we ever have now is how to treat it. So, you know, if, if your significant other hasn't been to the dentist in a while and we're going to get you healthy, yeah, it would be beneficial <laughs> for them to get in as well. Now, is it critical? I mean, I wouldn't say critical because what we want is for to get you healthy and then, you know, have you on great tools at home, you know, oral irrigator to flush everything out in there every single day, um, full mouth brushing. We're going to give you a lot of tools and techniques to use so that once we do get you healthy, we keep you on the road to health. But like any other infection, if your honey mm -hmm. is passing some bugs to you, or if you just like to get your mouth licked by a dog... <laughs> Some of those things may put you at a higher risk for getting this back because we can't yeah. immunize anyone from getting this infection again. But that's why coming in regularly, this help letting us help you to disrupt all that bacteria, that biofilm, mm -hmm. is all going to help to keep you on the road to health. And really, for most of us, once we find your specific formula, we just keep doing that, and you stay healthy. And mm -hmm. and I mean, this is a team effort for sure. Does that all make sense? Yes. 
So as you guys heard here, it's a really pivot in the conversation and it really brings both of us together, the clinician and the patient, because really getting somebody healthy is a team effort. Even if a patient's coming in six times a year for us to clean their teeth or do a periodontal maintenance for them, they're seeing themselves every single day. So unfortunately, we're not the star of the show. If they get on board with us, we have a much higher incidence of having much better long-term treatment outcomes. And I strongly believe in imagery and using analogies for patients. So when I'm talking about the microscope to a patient and they're looking at all the squirmy little bugs on there, one of the analogies that I love is think of these bacteria like termites in the foundation of a house. They live deep down inside your gum tissue, not just on top of it, which is why your great home care hasn't taken care of it. And so what I want the patient to understand is that <clears throat> this isn't a topical infection. These bacteria don't just live in their mouth. And because leaky and permeable gum tissue allow those bacteria to even more so get into our bloodstream and catch a ride on our 60,000 uh, miles of, of blood vessels. We really want our patients to understand that this is a whole health issue, not just a mouth issue. And when it comes to the type of cleaning that, that we need to do for our patients, what I often tell my patients is think of the cleanings we've been doing like a routine car wash. What you need is the full detail, really spending time getting in the nooks and crannies places we just can't reach with a traditional cleaning. And we're gonna use some antimicrobials. There's gonna be a little bit of homework on your part too. So using different analogies to say, hey, we are gonna do something different. So it's also probably gonna cost something different, take a few more appointments. So I'm trying to plant all of those seeds with my patients as I go along this process. And so, you know, when we think about a, a picture's worth a thousand words, not just the microscope, but in dentistry, why do we take so many intraoral photos? Because it's so much easier to tell our patient what's actually going on when we're talking about abfraction and occlusal issues and failing amalgams that have fractures underneath them and all these different problems that don't necessarily hurt. It's, it can be hard for patients to, you know, spend a little bit more money in treating a problem that they didn't think they had. But however, when they see the problem and they're tracking along with us, it makes that entire transition so much easier. So for me, I think about the microscope is like a photograph and then doing salivary diagnostics is like the x-ray to tell me what exact pathogens are present. So the process really goes like this. So it starts out with, I'm seeing a change in your gum tissue today after we do our traditional oral assessment. And then we simply show the patient what that change is when we look at the microscope. And all we have to do is give them a brief description of what we're talking about. Termites in the foundation of a house. Certain bacteria are not part of your good bacteria. Because a lot of patients will say, well, doesn't everyone have bacteria? Absolutely. Everyone has over 700 different types of bacteria in their mouth and only about a dozen of them are bad. And so patients are generally then asking us, how do we fix this problem? Because I now can see that I did come in contact with some bad bacteria and my mouth got sick. And this method actually ends up being very time saving because instead of talking about pocket depths and bleeding points and calculus, we talk about infection, bacteria and the overall health consequences of this infection. I found that usually chair side, it would take me about five minutes from the time I took the slide to the time that I was showing the patient and they were asking me, what are we going to do about this? That was about five minutes. Whereas my conversation before, I felt like I really had to kind of review some dental terminology, explain what I was seeing, explain what we needed to do. And it was about a 10 to 15 minute conversation. So at the end of both of those conversations, a picture, it was always more helpful for me to show the patient what I was seeing. <clears throat> Excuse me. So understanding the infection. So many times seeing is believing. The microscope allows us to rely less on our verbal explanations and our patient's trust in our findings. It provides, the microscope provides um, evidence to support our findings. It's not everything, but it supports our findings. This additional information also helps us to understand the aggressiveness of a patient's infection. And that knowledge guides us in the treatment recommendations to achieve more optimal health outcomes. So let's look at just a couple case studies here of how the microscope can assist in better understanding what is going on in a patient's mouth. Um, so this woman, so if you all were to see her in your dental chair tomorrow as a new patient and you saw her teeth, what would you think? We may immediately think bruxism for sure. There's a lot of abfraction going on in there. Maybe she's also a hard brusher. Let's look back at that medical history. Was she diabetic? Because I know they lose bone pretty rapidly. Is there a history of periodontal disease? So if we then go from this 
retracted photo and we take a microscope slide and we see that lo and behold, she has a high risk slide. She not only has spirochetes and motile rods, she has all kinds of white blood cells, but she has excellent home care. This particular patient had all of the above. She had bruxism. She wasn't wearing her night guard. She had a history of diabetes for over 20 years um, that was fairly controlled. And she didn't have any history of periodontal disease that she knew of. She had never had a deep cleaning. She never had SRP. However, after we saw her microscope slide, it was clear to me that we definitely needed to use antimicrobial therapy. She needed to go through some gum tissue therapy. So for her, I wasn't spending a whole bunch of time scaling and root planing in her mouth, but I was using antimicrobials, showing her how she could more adequately brush and, and, and cleanse her overall mouth. And we talked a lot about her diabetes and really needing to keep that under control. And so it definitely was a very big top priority for her to get that bruxism under control and to probably do some gum grafting. But I can tell you for sure that after her gum tissue therapy, looking at her before and after photograph, if you guys look at the color of her mouth, not just at the margins, but the full color of the mouth down into the vestibule and the microscope slide, it goes from a lot of, a lot of activity to very minimal activity. She's in a much better position after that gum tissue therapy to do the gum grafting and to get the rest of it healthy. Um, so that foundation really is key to everything. And so another case here. So if this is your patient tomorrow and you see this young lady with a bright red mouth, what are you going to think? So I specifically want you guys to look at just how red that front frenum is. Crazy, right? So, I mean, is she a hard brusher? Does she have acid reflux? Maybe she's a mouth breather. Maybe this is gingivitis. How do we know for sure? So with her microscope slide, she had a very serious infection as well. So her problem was definitely that we needed to work on gum tissue therapy, use antimicrobials, figure out what exact pathogens are all in her mouth. Certainly she has a lot of spirochetes in there and she even has a trichinomad down at the bottom. And after gum tissue therapy for her and um, using antimicrobials, getting her on a better home care regimen, really helping her to understand that it's full mouth biofilm disruption that's needed. Again, I mean, you look at the before and after microscope slides and you can see a huge difference, way less volume, lay, way less motility. But even looking at her photographs, I mean, the color of her mouth is profoundly less red. I mean, even that, 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 facial frenum is, is much more pale pink. Her overall mouth is paler pink and not just at the margins. So it really makes a huge, huge difference when we understand what's causing these patients infection. And we take those before and after photos and we take the before and after slides and, and use the, the salivary diagnostic lab test to understand what pathogens are there and to take another test after therapy so that we know for sure that we got that pathogen load under, under control. Because again, this infection isn't just an in this patient's mouth. For this young lady here, she had gingivitis, but you know, she was only in her 20s. So consider a microscope slide that was as active as hers. What that could potentially be doing to her entire body. I mean, as we mentioned earlier, those spirochetes have the propensity to go to our brain. I mean, so there could be a lot of systemic ramifications to these infections that we don't even know. And the rate in which patients lose bone from this infection is very dependent on their immune system, the specific types of bacteria they have. So while some patients may have a five millimeter pocket for five years, that doesn't necessarily mean that that infection is stable. There could be some health consequences that we're not seeing because their mouth and then the parameters that we're looking at aren't necessarily changing. Um, another case here. So what is causing this young lady's inflammation? Is she a poor brusher? Is it those orthodontic aligners? Is it plaque? Is it calculus? probably all of the above, right? So in her microscope slide, as you guys can see, she has a lot of activity as well. So calculus, calculus is actually not causative of periodontal disease. We certainly need to get rid of it, but it's not a cause of periodontal disease, nor are the aligners. This young lady was doing Invisalign through the mall. There was an Invisalign distributor at the mall that um, in the city that she lived in. And so her, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> her Invisalign was more important to her, unfortunately, than even getting her gum tissue healthy. And so when I talked to her about doing gum tissue therapy and explained to her that she had this infection, she actually wasn't too concerned, surprisingly. And I want to draw your guys' attention to 
her lower anterior number 25 there. She actually had a gum graft that was already failing. That graft was only a couple of years old. And so the the therapy for her, she wasn't ready to move forward with it. So what we did instead, because she wasn't ready to move forward with therapy, she refused that. She did agree to a six-week recheck. And so what we did is we got her on a water pick. We got her on some antimicrobial mouth rinses. And I stress daily, daily, daily biofilm disruption. But I did explain to her that because of the severity of her infection, that I did not think that it was going to resolve on its own with home care alone because she had spirochetes and those spirochetes can be so, so pathogenic, not can be, but they are very pathogenic and they live inside the gum tissue, not just on top of it. She also had a trichinomad on her slide, <clears throat> which tells me that it's a very mature biofilm and that that biofilm is extremely dysbiotic. And so at the six week um, follow-up appointment, she did come back in for her follow-up appointment, but unfortunately her mouth wasn't healed. So the gum tissue didn't have any visual or chartable, um, or, or, or chartable improvement. And so I recommended the same gum tissue therapy again, but unfortunately she refused again. So what are some considerations when a patient doesn't proceed with therapy? How do you guys feel when a patient refuses gum tissue therapy? For me, I often felt responsible for not being able to convince them. I thought maybe my verbal skills weren't good enough. I wasn't able to really explain what exactly was going on. I've heard from so many hygienists that they feel obligated to just kind of do as much therapy as they can to still get underneath the gum tissue because the patient doesn't actually know what we're doing in there. But unfortunately, if we're just chasing the debris and chasing the plaque, we're not actually curing the infection because again, Calculus is not causative. And if that infection persists, we may actually be leading to more black triangles in there, but it can be really, really difficult. And a lot of hygienists have shared with me that they just feel confused over what to do next. I mean, when we get them back in six months, do we just do another poofy? How long do we see these patients? It can be such a difficult um, task when we're relying just on visuals and our traditional diagnostic parameters. So I really believe that the more objective data that we have, the easier it is to diagnose and talk to our patients about needing to do something other than a prophy. And when, patho when patients see their pathogenic biofilm slide and photos and of their inflamed gingiva, it's an extra layer of reassurance that we've provided as much objective data as possible to assist in a solid diagnosis and recommendations. I mean, not every patient is going to say yes to treatment, but you know, patients that say yes, more patients do say yes to treatment when they fully understand their diagnosis and they can see the bad bugs that made them sick. So overall, when it comes to before and after microscope slides, <clears throat> what we're really looking for is, are there pathogenic bacteria on that microscope slide? What's there? What shapes are there? Because like Dr. Kai said in the big, what I shared in the beginning was that we can only identify bacteria in the microscope morphologically. So we're not simply looking for healthy bacteria, although it's awesome to take a slide on a patient that has a really healthy mouth and we show them their healthy bacteria because maybe in six months, six years, maybe they're not healthy anymore. And so they'll have that contrast of going, oh my gosh, I saw my slide before and it didn't look like this. But in this example here on the screen now, when we see on the left-hand side here, all this pathogenic bacteria, and then we look at the right-hand side of the screen and we see way less volume, way less motility. We know from, from, a, from, a, from just a shape standpoint that it looks a lot better. And even an untrained eye can see a huge difference in those slides there. What Dr. Kai said of the microscope is the fact remains that microscopic examination of bacterial biofilms give us a lot of information and very quickly and inexpensively and vividly. And <clears throat> that, is, that is so true in my experience. And in, in closing here with Dr. Kai's, a dental hygienist without a microscope is like a doctor without a stethoscope. And so it is really my, my hope that in that the goal, I mean, my goal overall is to really help to bridge the dental medical gap. And I feel like the microscope really helps to bring us one step closer because when we can show our patients versus, versus tell them, we're just giving them a lot more information on what we're seeing and what the changes are that we see. And so it's no longer our word against theirs or 
anything like that. And so I feel like the microscope just gives us a huge edge. And so it's my goal that we continue what Dr. Kai so wonderfully started all those years ago and continue that legacy. So I will, um, I finished a few minutes early here. I will toss it back over to Dr. Rowling here and uh, we will talk a little bit more about this uh, next slide here. So let me end my slideshow real quick. Or actually, let me let me put up my information there. I'll, I'll there send it to Dr. Rowling. <laughs> I'm going to read these questions to you, Tasha, because I know you can't see them. Yeah. Okay. So, and you have a few, and I want to thank everyone again for being here and be sure to stay on for a few minutes. Tasha's going to talk about um, an event coming up and how to reach her as well. Uh, Dr. Eisenberg states he met Dr. Keyes, or Kies, excuse me, in the 1990s in his lab. As a periodontist, I utilized the phase contrast microscope for 30 plus years, very helpful. Um, Cheryl wants to know, is that chart available in poster size? Uh, which chart? The, 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 the high risk, low risk, moderate risk ones? It was early on. So I think it was that one. Cheryl, yes, it's, it's, on my, it's available on my website. Okay. Yes. Let me see if she's added anything here. Okay, here we go. What type of microscope do you recommend? Yes, I can. Do you want me to just jump to that slide, Dr. Rowling? Sure, that's fine. Yeah, so there's a variety of different types of microscopes available, and there are so many really, really good ones. My personal favorite right now, um, because of ease of use and the price, is the Modic Panthera. And so the Modic Panthera comes with a 4K camera now, which is just unbelievable. So the slide on the bottom of the screen right now is with that 4K camera. And I'm just in love with this microscope because for the price, it's just under $4,000 and you can hook it up to a, uh, the monitor. If you have a TV monitor in your room right now, you can hook it up to that or you can hook it up to even to a computer screen. Um, they also, it also has an SD card that you can put in there. So if you wanted to take pictures of your slide, or if you wanted to record videos of your slide, you can do that. It also allows you to zoom in. And so that's my current personal favorite, but I've used a number of different microscopes. Um, I will say they are not all created equal. There's, um, some very inexpensive microscopes on the market. And sometimes if you go the too inexpensive route, you cannot see the, the bacteria very well. Okay, thank you. Let's see here. Uh, Jill would like to know, do you look at the sample immediately after collecting it or let it sit for 10 minutes then view the sample? She was trained years ago to let the sample sit for 10 to 15 minutes before viewing. Yes. So in practice, I usually would look at it within five minutes of taking it. I will say that the, um, the ideal, ideal time is 15 to 20 minutes after, and Bill Landers um, speaks of that a lot. And so the, the benefits to looking at it later are that sometimes the spirochetes can get a little bit shocked by the coldness of the slide, and so they can kind of hide in the plaque. So you may have a slide that's a high-risk slide, but it doesn't look quite as horrible as it actually would be 20 minutes later. So in my personal practice of using the microscope for well over a decade, um, I always looked at them right away because in the hygiene operatory, we don't always have time to wait and look at them later. But I will say when you look at them later, a, a bad slide, quote unquote, is often worse. And a good slide, I never really found that a slide that wasn't very pathogenic, all of a sudden it was just horrible later. So you're going to see more later, but I wouldn't say it's um, absolutely critical. And so when I train teams, we generally we look at them within five minutes. Okay. Question from Maria about antimicrobials. What are you using on someone with good home care, but elevated uh, white blood cell count on the slide? That's a great question. So if a patient didn't have a lot of volume or motility of bad pathogenic bacteria, and they did have a lot of white blood cells, the first thing that I'm going to look at is their medical history, because there's a reason for all of those white blood cells. And sometimes it goes back to something going on systemically. So maybe the patient just got over having the flu, or maybe their kids had been sick. There's can be a lot of different things going on, but we don't want to have an inflammatory response in the mouth for a long time when we're seeing those white blood cells. Um, there's a whole bunch of great antimicrobial um, courses on this particular platform. So I'm not going to say any specific one. There's more than one amazing one. Um, but when it comes to antimicrobials, 
for me personally, I stay away from, you know, alcohol products and things like that. So I try to be with more with gentle products. Question from, well, I think it's Layla. What type of path pathogens, excuse me, do you usually find in a patient with a full mouth of implants with inadequate home care? The same, exactly the same. Because unfortunately the um, implants, 70% of implants fail because of periodontal disease. And it's the exact same periodontal pathogens that are present. There are, there are a couple periodontal pathogens that are, that are found more often in implant cases where the, where the bacteria, um, cert, like ENs are a couple, a couple of the periodontal pathogens are more prevalent with implant failure. But unfortunately, even in full mouth extraction cases, let's call it an all on X. If that patient had periodontal disease, they had all of their teeth extracted. Studies have shown that those periodontal pathogens are in the bone. And so unfortunately, when we place implants later, we can actually be seeding those implants with those periodontal pathogens. And so it's, it's really the same ones. More questions coming in here. So, and they're all great questions. How much, oh, I'm sorry. Can we get hands-on courses to learn and then get this microscope? So that, so that I'm, I'm teaching a course, I'm, I'm co-hosting a course in September in Nashville that will have hands-on microscope use. So you can, you know, touch it, feel it, ask questions about it, take slides on your, you and your team if you want. Um, that is an option. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. But with other, is that, I think that answers the question. There's not too I many so. courses aside, aside from that. Um, generally, when I train teams, like the videos that you guys saw tonight of me in, a, in an operatory with a patient, I have over seven hours of videos like that showing my, showing clinicians how to speak to patients about taking microscope samples, just all the different verbal skills that are involved here too. I just put the link up for your event. And that is that question is from Dr. Weichens. And I believe he is in Kabul, Afghanistan. So he would have ah. quite the hike. <laughs> but I would encourage going I to Nashville. Online if you're going, if you're going to the US, you have to go to Nashville. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, reach out to me, reach out to me um, email wise, and we can talk about some videos that I can help with. That would be great. How much do you charge a patient to take a hygiene sample? I don't recommend to charge anything. I recommend to do the, the plaque samples for free because I've just found that the microscope pays for itself. I mean, over and over and over again. And it's, there's nothing better for patient motivation either. How do we learn more about these types of bacteria and how to read the slide so we sound educated when talking about the slide? Any classes you'd recommend? Yes. Stay so, on a minute here. You'll learn more, but go ahead. Yes, you'll learn more about that. So, um, so training to use the microscope. So my in-person class will will show you, will give you the opportunity to use to touch and feel the microscope and see if it's right for you essentially. And then what I do from there is I train people virtually and I have like these videos and we talk about how to identify the different bacteria so that you can sound informed and, and feel very confident when you're explaining the slide to a patient. Great. Jesse would like to know, can you utilize this method for estimating karyogenic microbe levels for patient education? That's a great question. I mean, um, when it comes to strep mutans and some of the the uh, caries detection, the phase contrast microscope, um, I haven't seen it used too much in that way because we can only identify the bacteria from a shape standpoint. And so we're going to see a lot of cocci and we're not going to know the difference. So there's different caries tests out there. So the microscope, I don't think would be a perfect fit for that. Okay. For this, this specific type of microscope that is a phase contrast like this one. Does insurance consider the information from the microscope when considering payment? They do not. I always have it in the clinical notes, but unfortunately there's not even an ADA code for using the microscope. And so <clears throat> in practices that are using the microscope, a lot of times they'll, they'll have an internal code that's not filed to insurance. It's just for tracking purposes and to remember like, okay, I took a slide on this patient last time, but unfortunately not. Let's see here. Would it be overkill to do salivary testing to along with the microscope? I always do salivary testing alongside of it, always. So for me, <clears throat> the microscope is like a picture and the 
lab test, the salivary diagnostics is like the x-ray. So while we can, we can see morphologically if there's pathogenic bacteria there, we don't know quantitatively exactly what's there. Um, there's a couple really bad pathogenic bacteria that actually are too um, small to see under a face contrast microscope. So AA and PG are two very well studied periodontal pathogens that are extremely aggressive, but we can't and see them underneath a face contrast microscope. Now that said, if, we're, if a patient does have AA or PG, their microscope slide's not gonna look crystal clear. They're gonna have a lot of other bacteria because the thing with these bad perinol pathogens is they all like to live together. So by the time a slide looks really highly aggressive, it's got spirochetes and spinning rods and trichinomads and all that kind of stuff, it's going to look pretty bad. So what I share with my patients is, okay, so we're so this is the change that we're seeing in your gums today. This definitely explains it. You came in contact with some bad bugs and your mouth got sick. The next thing we need to do is a lab test to tell us what exactly these bad bacteria are so that when we're when we're doing your, your gum tissue therapy, we know how aggressive this infection is. So to me, they're hand in glove. There is a question about workflow, and I think it's really critical because we know dental practices are busy. Uh, yeah. Tiffany would like to know, how long does your office allow for a recare appointment? She's worried about time. She doesn't even have a spare five minutes, but she'd love to implement this. Yes, great question. So in most practices, when they're implementing the microscope initially, you're not going to take a slide on every single patient. So depending on the practice and depending how many microscopes you have would will kind of help to dictate your overall patient flow. So for example, um, I'm working with one practice now that has three hygienists and one microscope. And so their goal is that each of the hygienists are going to take about two to three slides per day, and they're going to identify the patients during their chart prep of who they're going to take a slide on. So for a lot of practices, it's going to, it's going to be their new patients, and then it's going to be anyone that they've spoke with about bleeding in the past. So when they're in their chart prep, if they talk to the patient about having bleeding gums, needing to you know floss more, brush better, all those different things, they're going to take a slide on those people. And from there, the goal is to, to get that patient to transition into periodontal therapy of some sort. And so my goal is to not do therapy that day. Instead, we're going to explain to them what infection they have. We're going to go over all the financials. We're going to get their insurance worked up. We're going to do a lab test and we're going to get that patient back to do gingivitis, to do SRP or, or what have you. And remember when we use the microscope, I mean, there's, there's, a, like, there's a learning curve to a microscope, just like when we first came out of practice. I mean, I, I mean, I still remember the first day that I was in a dental practice and I was thinking, oh my gosh, how am I going to have enough time in one hour? And one of my girlfriends said, they're like, you just will, Tasha, you'll, you'll be fine. The microscope is the same. Initially, it takes a little bit more time, but after you get the hang of it, it's about five minutes to get that patient to understand like, hey, you have an infection versus that 10 to 15 minute conversation about pocket depths and dental terminology and jawbone loss and all those kinds of things. So workflow tends to be <clears throat> x-rays, your any photographs that you're going to take, do your periodontal charting, and then you'll if you if you identify a, a change, then you're going to take a slide. There are two questions here. I think that we're going to have you move forward with the promotional part, and hopefully, Cherry and Tiffany, if you could stay on for this portion or reach out directly to Tasha um, with her uh, contact information that's in the handout. So let me go ahead and mute my. Yes. Yeah, so the so the event that um, that I'm co-hosting with the amazing Jennifer Sider is called Boots, Bugs, and Biofilm. And so we really believe, and because we know for sure that dentistry is just so much more than teeth care. So this is a two-day event that we're hosting in Nashville, and it's um, day one is is um, eight to five. Day two is eight noon. And the overall goal is to is that everyone will leave there with refreshed or revived periodontal procedure. So on the following Monday morning, you will be in the know with, with what kind of periodontal uh, procedures that you want to do. If you want to implement new things like <clears throat> salivary lab diagnostics, if you want to implement a microscope, you'll have all of those tools. We're going to have PerioProtect there and, and uh, several other wonderful people. And so the event, the goal really is that you have action items. Even if you don't want to use a microscope, even if you don't want to use salivary diagnostics, the goal is that you're going to have refreshed verbal skills. Um, we're going to do a strength finders test so that everyone understands better their own personality profile. Um, my co-host Jennifer Sider and I have very different personalities. I am 
more analytical, direct to the point, and she just wants everything to be fun and have and be like a party. And so I think we're a really good match for this. So we will make sure that everyone has a lot of fun at the event, but they're also going to learn a whole bunch as well. And so um, this event is September um, 15th through 16th in Nashville. And we are only about a mile and a half from downtown. So everyone could take advantage of the honky tonk picture that we have here. And you guys can um, go to the website and read a little bit more about it too, and kind of see the rundown of, of day to day. But that's all I'll, <clears throat> that's all I'll say about that, Dr. Rowling. Tasha, you want to talk a little bit about what you provide in terms of other classes on your website in case they weren't aware of that? Yeah. So, um, I would say what I really specialize in is more health centered dentistry. I mean, we're all health centered, of course, in dentistry, but I take more of a, you could call it a functional medicine approach, if you will. So I really love using objective diagnostic parameters. I think that it's super helpful when we can show our patients versus telling them. And so when it comes to microscope training, um, I don't provide the microscope. I just send people to, you know, where, where they can purchase a microscope. I have a relationship with Axe Microscopes, which is a, a small family owned company here in Nashville. And I just love them because their prices are great. Their customer service is fabulous. And, um, and I've just, I've just had such a great relationship with them for over a decade. And so if a, if a practice wants to get a microscope, they get their microscope from them. And then I do virtual training. And so when a practice wants to implement a microscope, it's a really great time to calibrate their hygiene department. And so I would say most of the practices that I work with, we just take that opportunity when we start working together to look at what their periodontal protocols are and maybe, you know, elevate different areas or enhance different areas so that we can make sure that the patients are having the most optimal health outcomes. And so we do training calls just like we're doing right now. And um, we have lots of opportunities for clinicians to ask questions. I use those training videos, like you, I used a couple of the videos um, tonight so that, that clinicians have the ability to see and hear in real times how they can utilize these new verbal skills and talk to patients um, in a little bit different way. Because for me, I really believe that we should keep more of our dental terminology to our clinical notes that we're filing, filing to dental insurance. And when we're talking to patients, I really like to talk with them at the same vocabulary that they're already used to and speak to them more like a physician would. So when I see a change in a patient's gum tissue, I simply say that I'm seeing a change in your gums today. You have redness, inflammation, and even bleeding. This definitely appears to be a gum infection caused by bacteria. So if a, I mean, most of our patients have had some type of bacterial infection in their life, so they really get it. And so I have dozens of program materials. So I assist teams with their clinical notes. Um, I help teams with chart prep. I mean, verbal skills is probably one of the main things that I help teams with is just talking about these these um, different different treatment modalities differently. Um, I teach teams and train teams in using salivary diagnostics so that they understand when they're when they're recommending a lab test to a patient, how do you talk to the patient about doing a lab test? Because it's something new. And then when you get that result report back, how do you know if it's a good report or a bad report? How do we read that? And so I assist teams in looking at the patient's medical history differently. So if a patient has a history of heart disease, for example, and then I identify that they have um, a periodontal infection in their mouth, I, I don't really like to use any kind of scare tactics for that patient of saying like, oh my gosh, you have periodontal disease. I'm diagnosing you with periodontal disease, which is an infection, which could make you X number of times more likely to have a heart attack. What I'm going to talk to that patient about is, hey, you know, Mr. Mr. Smith, if we go ahead and get your gum tissue healthy, we're actually reducing your risk factors of having another stroke. We can actually reduce um, your C-reactive protein, and, and I can go through all that. And the same is true for diabetes. When I have a patient that is diabetic and I'm recommending gum tissue therapy, what I'm going to share with them is, hey, this gum tissue therapy isn't just going to help your mouth. Studies have shown that gum tissue therapy will help you to control your glycemic index. It'll actually decrease your A1C. So this isn't just mouth treatment. It's going to affect your whole body in a, in a positive way. And so I like to encourage patients to do the right thing because it's going to help their whole body, not just help their mouth. Because unfortunately, a lot of the times when we're recommending treatment for patients, they didn't even know that they had a problem in the first place. So we have to be really gentle with the way that we recommend new things sometimes for patients. Any other questions for Tasha? We really thank you all for being here this evening. Tasha, tell me before we close, 
with all of this great information, who are the patients that would object? That's my question. I mean, if you see it right in front of you, what would the what would their reason be? What would their rationale be? That patients object when they see the microscope? No, when they when you when you inform them of, you know, pathogens and so forth. Yeah. What have you had patients that say that just aren't going to go through treatment? I mean, I'm just curious when I see this and it's that much in front of me and it makes so much sense. It unfortunately, yes. I mean, I will say once I implemented using the microscope and salivary diagnostics, I had less nose. However, there were still some patients that, you know, like the last case that I shared tonight, financials were what was holding her back. Um, you know, which is sometimes surprising when she was going through Invisalign. You know, it's like some people right. have money the to do they don't have money to do gingivitis therapy. And sure. so, um, you know, I really believe in educating patients and letting them know, making sure your clinical notes are solid as a rock when you when it comes to explaining, it, it, clearly explaining what, what your recommendations are and that they have periodontal disease and what you're diagnosing them with. And if a patient does refuse treatment, I explain to them that the cleanings we've been doing is like a routine car wash. And what you need is that full detail, you know, spending time getting in the nooks and crannies. If you just want a profi today, that traditional cleaning, it's really meant for healthy patients. And so it's not going to get in the nooks and crannies. We're not going to be, you know, killing the bacteria that's actually causing this infection. But if that's what you're telling me that you want, that's what we'll do. I want you to know that the next time that you come in, we're going to check your gum tissue again, because I'm really concerned about your infection. And definitely, it typically depends on the practice of how many times they will see that patient um, before they maybe, you know, they, before they refer them to somebody else or release okay. them from the practice because supervised neglect after so long um, is kind of a gray area. It's, it doesn't make any of us feel very good. And it's supervised neglect. So um, I, I just, love your communication skills around this. And I think it's really important that everybody hears this because, you know, we do have that patient. Um, and I think the information that you share with everybody is just excellent. So thank you so much for your presentation this evening. And let's thank everyone for being here. Please be sure to refer to the handout. They'll have Tasha's information and um, anything you'd like to say in closing. Yeah, I think my only my last my last little tidbit on the um, patients refusing is that no today isn't always no tomorrow. I would say that the majority of patients that refuse treatment from me, I can only even right now think of two that after years never said yes. And it was um, just fundamentally something that they that they just weren't ready to do. And I think it can be really easy for us to assume the patient's going to refuse every single time and not go through the same education because it, we, we end up feeling like a broken record and we're like, oh, they're not going to say yes anyway. You know, it's like that failing amalgam that's been fractured for 15 years. And it's not bothering them. They're never going to do it. But we still have to work to create urgency every single time. And we also have to be really careful about making sure that our clinical notes reflect that what we recommended and what the patient stated. Because Correct. we can recommend something, but if we don't say that, if we don't also notate what the patient's response was, that could get us into trouble potentially. So having mm -hmm. really solid clinical notes, I think is an underrated deal in dentistry. So for me, I yeah. think more is, more is always better. More is better. Well, thank you so much for everyone uh, for being here this evening. Thank you, Tasha. We're going to go ahead and close. You will be redirected to complete a quiz for CE credit, and you'll receive the email here in just a couple of minutes as well. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank you, guys.